Hey, welcome to Northeast. We are so glad you've decided to join us in our online campus today. You know, here at Northeast, we really believe in unleashing the love of Jesus every day, everybody, everywhere. And here in our online campus, we get to do that in some really cool ways. We have people every weekend who join us from all around the world, and we love having this opportunity to come alongside you and walk with you as you take your first step toward Jesus or your next step toward Jesus. But no matter where you are on that faith spectrum, we are so excited that you're here. We've been praying for you and we can't wait to walk alongside you. In just a few moments, we're gonna hear some really awesome teaching, but before we do, we're going to spend some time together in worship. You know, I love worship because it gives me a really solid opportunity to take the focus off myself and put it right on God where it belongs. I love this opportunity to be reminded that He is so good and that He has done so much for us. Let's sing together. Hey everybody, you doing all right? Happy New Year's. Welcome to 2020, welcome to a new decade. We get to kick it off in style today. We're glad that you're here and we're gonna do something fun. Um, I thought there's never been a better weekend in the history of all weekends to learn some new songs. So we're gonna do that today and I encourage you to join in with me today. Uh, if you've uh, spent some time in a relationship with Jesus, there's nothing you're gonna sing today that's new to you. We might just sing it in a different way, but uh, all these truths are gonna be familiar and I encourage you to join in and worship with us as we sing to our great and almighty God. Uh, let's go ahead and stand. I want to pray and uh, encourage you, uh, no matter where you are, whether you're in the room, whether you're at home watching it online, uh, the Holy Spirit is with you. He's where you are right now, and He's moving around you and within you. The presence of God is with you, and He's shaping and transforming and calling us to something new and something greater than where we currently are. So I encourage you to open yourself up to receive from that spirit today. Let's pray and we're gonna give him all the glory and honor he deserves. God, we thank you for who you are and what you have done for us. We thank you that you came as one of us and gave your life for us and lived among us. And uh, today as we sing these songs, I pray that uh, they're more than just songs, they're more than just words, but they are prayers, they are declarations of our heart. God, I pray that so many of us are uh, focusing on what we want to achieve or accomplish this year. I pray that we leave space for you. God, this morning we give you space, we give you room to move, room to change us. And we give you all of the praise and all of the honor today because you're worth it and only you're worth it. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. All right, let's sing together. Born to the darkness, I was rejected and cut off from hope. I couldn't see his love for me. They said he's not who he seems Don't get your hopes up for healing The lies fell away When I saw his face My heart burst to light I saw the light in his eyes When he looked at me My
Isn't that great news today? Let's fill this room with praise, with our voices, lift it up all over this place that we know who we are and who we belong to. Sing this out with me. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. You say I am chosen.
the servers are going to be coming forward to pass out communion. And as the tray comes by, I want to invite you to take a piece of the bread and a cup of the juice and just hold on to them. We'll take them together as a church family in just a minute. You might not know this, but God is in the business of doing something new, not just in January, but all year long. And the words of that song, that powerful song that we just sang together, we, we said, you are a way maker, you're a miracle worker, you're a promise keeper, the light in the darkness. That is who our God is. And if we really believe those characteristics of our God to be true, then it means that we believe that he will make a way through whatever wilderness we might be facing right now. In Isaiah 43, we read the promise of the Lord's victory that is yet to come. And as I read these verses to you, I wanna challenge you to think about whatever wilderness it is that you're facing right now or whatever feels impossible in your life. Listen to his words. He said, I am the Lord, your Holy One, Israel's creator and king. I am the Lord who opened a way through the waters, making a dry path through the sea. I called forth the mighty army of Egypt with all its chariots and horses. I drew them beneath the waves and they drowned, their lives snuffed out like a smoldering candle wick. But forget all that, it is nothing compared to what I'm going to do, for I am about to do something new. See, I have already begun, do you not see it? I will make a pathway through the wilderness. I will create rivers in the dry wasteland. The wild animals in the fields will thank me, the jackals and owls too, for giving them water in the desert. Yes, I will make rivers in the dry wasteland so my chosen people can be refreshed. You see, when you feel like something feels impossible, God is always doing something new. It might not be the new that you expected or the new that you wanted, but he's always doing something new. When the Israelites began their journey, I would imagine that most of them never realized that they would reach a point of that journey that felt completely impossible. But when they reached that point, they realized that impossible is actually what God does best. So when they were at their worst, God showed up and he split the sea so the Israelites could walk straight through on dry ground. He comforted them at their worst because he knew that they would later sing and tell about how amazing God was and how he had made a way when there was no other way for them to get through that darkness. He is a God who moves mountains. He will remove any barrier that exists from you getting to him. What are the mountains in your life that God has already moved? Do you believe that there will still be mountains yet to come that he will move in your life because he will? He's the God who carries us through storms. He opens prison's doors to set us free. He is a God who is fighting for you right now. He's fighting for your attention. He's fighting for your time. He's fighting for your heart. So does God have your attention right now? God is the light in the darkness. And we just came out of a season, a time of year where we're celebrating the light that Jesus brought into this world. And what that time serves as just a glimpse of the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross for each and every one of us so that we could experience God's forgiveness, so that we could experience God's grace, so we would know that when we think about God, we remember that he is a way maker, he's a miracle worker, he's our promise keeper, he's the light in the darkness. That is who our God is. So before we take the bread and the juice together, I just want us to sing these words one more time and think about all the impossible things he has already done in your life. Is your way make miracle work, promise keep light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are way make miracle work, promise light in the darkness, my God. That is who our God is. So as we take the bread together, remember that this represents Jesus' body. And we drink the juice, which represents Jesus' blood poured out on the cross for each of us. Let's pray. God, you make a way when there is no other way that we would get through things in life. Help us remember every single day, not just once a week, the sacrifice that you made so that we could experience a life in you where things feel impossible, you show up and you do new things every 
single day. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. I'd like to invite the servers to come forward again. We're going to be collecting offering. And we collect this offering every single week. And whether you're here in the room with us or you're watching online, you can always give on the website or through the app as well. We tell you that you are surrounded by some of the most generous people in the city of Louisville. And that is not just a thing that we say. We really mean it because you continue to show up time and time again and show us just how generous you are. Every single week, we take just a moment to celebrate all that has been done because of your generosity. And sometimes it's important to just take a step back and remember why we are generous at all. And the very simple answer is that our God has been so generous to each of us. Everything that we have is God's and he's blessed us with it. In Philippians 4.19, we read the promise that God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. So when you look back on 2019, when and how have you stopped to acknowledge all the many ways that God has met your needs? Not just your financial needs, but your health, the community you have around you, the hope that you have in him. None of us will ever be able to repay him for all that he has done for us. The truth is we know that there are so many legitimate needs and organizations that are asking for your money, but we believe in the power of the local church and the impact that we can make when we all come together to make an impact in Jesus' name. When you become a stakeholder at Northeast, you start practicing generosity and you get to watch as Jesus' love is unleashed all over our community, all over our schools, and all over the world. So if you're ever asked or if you've ever wondered, you know, why is this place so generous? The very simple answer we have is that Jesus is why. So thank you for your generosity. Wow. But I feel like we should just like say amen. I mean, I'll sit down on the front row and listen to a little bit more of that. Melinda preaching, Corbin and the team leading. Powerful way to start the new year. Hey, uh, welcome to the Roaring Twenties again. <laughs> uh, happy New Year to all of y'all. I am uh, really thankful that you are here today with us. And uh, we're going to kick off a new sermon series today uh, called Significant. Um, here's the reality. For a lot of us, one of the undeniable perpetual struggles that we will suffer from throughout our lives is this lingering feeling of insignificance. Whether you are you know, at the top of the mountain and you've accomplished everything that you ever wanted and some, and you're still like, why, why don't I feel like my life is full? Why do I feel like I need more than even this? Or whether you're like kind of in the valley and you haven't accomplished what you wanted to and I don't know, your, your life didn't feel like it shook out like you wanted it to shake out. And you feel like, man, am I just less than? Am I below average? Wherever you find yourself, I think a lot of us just struggle with this sort of like, what's, what's meaning look like? What's significance look like in this life? Well, Jesus has a different answer than what you'd expect. And over the next four weeks, we're actually going to uh, study that. We're going to study that by opening our Bibles to the Gospel of Luke and looking at four different calling stories, four different stories in which Jesus calls his disciples out of the mundaneness of their life and into significance with him. And uh, I think it might have a powerful word for you. So I'm encouraging you, don't make this like a one-off sermon or a one-off series. If you're going to be with us for the series, stick with us for, for, for all four weeks. If, if you're new to Northeast, all right, don't church hop and church shop off of us yet. Stick with us for the four weeks of this series and just check out what Jesus has to say. Now, with that being said, I would like everybody to stand with me. Stand real quick. And uh, we're going to read together Luke chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. This is the first calling story of Jesus calling his first disciples. You'll probably recognize some of these names because they're some of the hot shots of the apostolic circle. And, uh, and we're going to see how Jesus welcomes them into his circle. Uh, we're going to do it in a congregational reading style. I'll read the part in white. Y'all read the part in, uh, in highlighted yellow. And we'll bounce back and forth here. Luke chapter 5, verse 1. Luke writes, Once, while Jesus was standing beside the lake of Gennesaret, and the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God... He saw two boats there at the shore of the lake, and the fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. (laughs) 
Uh, when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, and for the record, this is Simon Peter. This is Peter. Uh, Put out into the deep water, Peter, and let down your nets for a catch. And when they'd done this, they caught so many fish that their nets were beginning to break. So they signaled for their partners in the other boat to come over and help. And they came over and they filled both boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it all going down, he fell down at Jesus' knees and said, And then Jesus said to Simon Peter, do not be afraid. Got nothing to fear here. From now on, you'll be catching people. And when they had brought their boats to shore, they left everything and followed him. And I'm going to ask you to repeat that last phrase with me because I think this is at the heart of where we're going with this series. Uh, Repeat after me. They left everything and followed him. It's the word of the Lord. Uh, You can be seated. And I hope this year you don't just make this a word from the Lord. I hope you make this your word for 2020. Follow, follow, follow. All right, now here's what I believe. I believe that if something's worth preaching once, it's worth preaching five times over. So to begin today, I wanna circle back to a question that I asked our congregation a few months ago. And uh, I wanna ask those of you uh, who are in it today to consider it briefly, because I think it's a good question to meditate and reflect on as we move into a new year. All right, here's the question. What do you want most? What do you want most in life? Or maybe a better way to ask it would be this. What do you actually want most in life? Now, for those of you who this might be confusing for, or for others of you who don't really think about life's big questions, anytime you get asked, you're like, oh, I don't know. Okay, there are are three different metrics or, or indicators, if you will, that if you look at it, both Jesus and conventional wisdom tells us, will show you what's really at the center of your heart. Your money, your time, and your thoughts. If you look at these, it'll show you what your heart's affections are. Okay, so Jesus says it like this. He says, where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. Or in other words, you wanna know where your heart's at? Follow the money trail. Or how about this? Your time, I mean, good gracious. Your time's your life. Tick tock, tick tock, tick. It's a non-renewable resource. And so where you spend your time, it's actually where you're spending your life. So have you ever took audit of, of, of your time before? Or how about this last one, your thought life? This is one that we don't think about much, but if you look in uh, within and think about your thoughts, where you give those, it can really reveal what's going on in your heart. What makes you sad? What makes you angry? What gets you fired up? What do you aspire towards? What do you hope for? What do you daydream about? These are amazing indicators at what's going on in the inside. So all that being said and all that being considered, I have a question for you. What do you actually want most in life? Now, don't answer that. In fact, that was more of a rhetorical question because I don't even want you to consider that anymore because I'm just gonna tell you. I'm just gonna tell you what you want most in life. You see, here's what we're really good at. When we're asked hard questions like this, we're really good at deceiving ourselves and like shedding a, a better light on ourselves than what we actually are. And I think that new year, new you, we need to be brutally honest before we embark upon goals for the new year. So according to the numbers, According to the media, according to the art, according to the journals and the literature that we see produced today in our culture, here's what most Americans are about. First, uh, it starts with financial comfort at the top. Like this is what a lot of us want. Okay, listen, Tyler, I don't need to be rich. I just wanna have enough money to basically do whatever I want whenever I want, but not rich. Um, Also, I want a job with some meaning and some clout. Like I wanna feel like I'm making a difference in the world and also be kinda high up on the org chart. You don't have to be that high, but I wanna be high and I wanna continue to ascend the org chart as well because I've noticed now that I'm in my 40s, I'm not getting those promotions that I used to get when I'm 30s. The 30 year olds are getting that, I don't like that. Also, I want epic, epic children. And by epic children, I just mean my children need to be better than your children. Um, Also, I want good health 
which if I'm older, that means I want a clean bill of health. I want to know that I at least got five to 10 healthy years in front of me. And if I'm younger, it just means I want to look good when I'm standing on the boat at the lake. Uh, I want regular fun experiences. So semi-annually, I want to take really nice vacations. And every weekend, I want to go to really bougie restaurants that serve locally sourced food and drink pour over coffee and pretend like I know what I'm talking about when it comes to good wine, you know, razzle dazzle, right? Whatever. Um, I also want, uh, I want a soulmate. And when I find my soulmate, I want sexual fulfillment. And if I can't find sexual fulfillment with my soulmate, I want a new soulmate. And I also want Insta fame. And some of you kind of roll your eyes at that, but man, for the emerging generation, this is a big deal. A lot of time invested there. I want to take pictures of my life. Picture perfect pictures of my life that make me and my good looking friends look adventurous and fashionable and cool. And then I have to post it because if I don't post it, it didn't really happen, right? So I have to post it so that the world can validate my existence with little thumbs and little hearts, Insta fame. And then last but certainly not least, I wanna live in a country where I have self autonomy and the ability to express myself however I want to. I wanna be able to do what I want, when I want, because I feel like it, and I want that for me. Not everyone, especially not my political enemies, I don't want it for them because they're intolerant, they're jerks, they're bigots, but I do want it for me. Self-autonomy and self-expression. Okay, now, ladies and gentlemen, this is, this is what America wants. Okay, I know where some of your pushback is. Some of you are like, Tyler, that's not, that's not, that's them, that's not me. I'm far more sophisticated and nuanced than that. And that's fine, you can tell yourself that if you want to. But I think for most of us, we're just fronting. Because if we were honest, if an outside auditor came in and they were able to audit your time, your money, and your thought life without any spin from you, well, the reason why I think this or do this or spin this, okay, no, 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 just, shh, okay. if they could just, if they could just audit it, I think that most of our lives would be pointed in this direction more than we would ever realize and more than we would ever admit. This is what the numbers show us. Okay, you, okay, you want the numbers? Here's what the numbers tell us. Numbers tell us that the average American gives away less than 2% of their money. Why? Because the majority of Americans spend 100% of their money or more. But how do you spend more than 100% of your money? You know, right? Okay, or more. And so because of that, we're crushed underneath consumer debt, credit debt, and you know, a house payment that was far too big for us to pay for to begin with. And we have no margin to be generous because we wanted financial comfort. When it comes to our job, uh, okay, it's got one of the most deadly addictions that's wreaking havoc on families and people's physical and mental health. Workaholism. Have you noticed this? People are putting in 70, 80 hours a week, nonstop, sacrificing family and marriage at the altar of work. No Sabbath. And there's like this sense of self-pride and self-importance because we, we, we work so hard. Don't believe me? Do a little social experiment this week and ask all your friends, hey, how's it going? and see how many of them respond to you with the word busy or some rendition of it. When it comes to our kids, gone are the days of the helicopter parent as if that wasn't bad enough and arrived are the days of the lawnmower parent. You've heard of this, right? Okay, so you know what the lawnmower parent does? Just walks right in front of their kid and mows down anything in the way. Any adversity, any authority figure that might ever correct your child, any character building experiences, just mows it right down. Uh, when it comes to good, uh, to good health, there's literally a million options. Seriously, like there's a million options. You can do the paleo, you can do the whole 30, you can do the juice cleanse, you can do CrossFit or Orange Theory, you can you know, do yoga, hot yoga, goat yoga. I mean, do you, does anybody do, have you done goat yoga before? I mean, okay, no, but you, you did? Okay, so there's one. One person who's done goat yoga, there's your, your, your resident expert in goat yoga. Um, I mean, it's, it's crazy. Oh, apparently Planet Fitness is making a comeback. Did anybody see them on New Year's Eve? Like all the hats, they, they blew their entire marketing budget for the year. Uh, focus. Uh, also, okay, when it comes to sex, pornography is a multi-billion dollar industry and most of America are addicted when it comes to social media. Did you know that the average American spends two hours and 22 minutes on social media a day? That's not even counting streaming services. Okay, and if you add the streaming services in together, don't tell me you're actually busy. So look, okay, what's my point in, in saying all this? Here's my point. I'm not trying to shame anyone in the room because I'm probably as guilty of this as many of you are, more than I realize, more than I would ever admit. My point in showing you all this is, is this, well, if we are going to embark on a new year and really carve out a new us, 
substantive, transformative goals, then we have to begin with a brutally honest assessment of reality. And this is the reality. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to present to you the American dream, the American depiction of the good life. Get the job, make the ched, climb the ladder, nice vacations, lots of sex, and do a little Peloton to keep the belly flat. <laughs> now, uh, that all having been said, I have another question for you. Question. Who told you that this works? Who told you that it works? In America, this is just the, the accepted belief. What is a life of meaning and significance? and happiness look like, ta-da. And who told you this was, this was a formula that actually added up? Who told you? Because I got a 2020 resolution for you. Whoever told you that, you need to cut them out of your life today. Who told you? Think of the person who loves you the most. Would they ever tell you this? Hey, look, I love you, honey, with all my heart. So here's what you need to know. Unless you make a buttload of money, you'll never be significant to me. So get to work. What about the people who trust you and you trust the most? Your best friend. Would they ever tell you that? Hey, hey bro, you're my best friend, so I'm going to tell you the secret of the meaning of life. Are you ready? Disney cruises. <laughs> Every year. Even when your kids are too old for them, still go. It's not creepy. Lots of adults do it. <laughs> okay. Uh, do you, would you ever say this to your kids? Hey, hey, little buddy, I love you. I love you so much. I spent a big chunk of my life raising you with very little gratitude, but I don't begrudge you for that. So here's what I want you to know, though. Unless you grow up and get a powerful job, have a keen sense of fashion, and have thousands of Insta followers, you'll never get my approval. Of course you wouldn't say that. Okay, here's an interesting twist. Think about the billions of people who live in the developing world today who will never have access to any of this. They will never have access to financial comfort. They'll never have a super powerful job. Like half their children will die because of infant mortality rates. Good health, preventable diseases are wreaking havoc on their community. Regular fun experiences, they've never even heard of a vacation before. Soulmate, sexual fulfillment, they don't get to pick their spouse. Insta fame, they got internet. Self autonomy and expression, yeah right. Think about them for a second. And can you imagine how elitist, smug, and privileged we sound when we say, sorry, you are only significant. You will only be happy if you can accomplish this. So I guess you're just destined to unhappiness by the nature of your birth. So, okay, here's the ironic thing. If you've ever uh, visited the developing world before, do you know what's interesting? You always come back saying the same thing. Anybody? You always come back saying, look at how happy they were. How are they so happy? Look at how happy they were. They don't even have cable. But look at how happy they were. How is it possible? Well, I'll tell you how it's possible. Perhaps, maybe, just perhaps, our formula for human flourishing in the United States of America is drastically miscalculated and mis uh, mistaken. And that having been said, let me point out to you one more person. What about God? Did he tell you this? <laughs> My children, sons and daughters, the metrics for eternal glory. Blessed are the sexually fulfilled. Blessed are the financially comfortable. Blessed are ye who express yourself and reject any external norms or transcendent force. Blessed are ye. You, you smile, right? Because you know that couldn't be any further from Jesus. So who told you this? If the people who loved you would never say this to you, if the God who created you would never say this to you, then who told you this? I'll tell you who told you this. You know who told you this? It's the people and the powers shaping our culture that want to control you, own you, manipulate you, and monetize you for their good and not yours. And that is the truth, my friends. There are people and powers like that out there. And they're preaching what I would call the gospel of the American dream. Have you heard of this before? Basically, there are two key action steps that they will shape your mind and disciple you towards in our culture. Here they are. Get more and do you. 
Every day, voices, messaging is coming across your airwaves nonstop that says, this is what the good life is about. Get more, do you. Get more, do you. Get more, do you. And until you succumb to that, you will never feel meaning. You'll never feel happiness. You'll never feel significance. Get more, do you. Okay, so get more. About 70, 80 years ago, uh, there was a, uh, a synergized partnership between government, economy, business, and marketing to come together and convince the American populace coming out of the Great Depression and into an economic boom that we need to spend more no matter how much more we have. Just got to get more. So they executed on five key strategies over the last several decades. And all five of them have really just shaped us in profound ways. Uh, now, some of you have heard me riff on these before, so I'll just keep it brief. But here are the five. And these are powerful forces in our culture. I want you to get woke to them so that you can see them. So you can see them around you every single day. Uh, first is inadequacy marketing. It's this idea that somehow you are inadequate in some way until you buy my product. Second one's planned obsolescence. It's when your stuff wears out when it really shouldn't have to. So you gotta go buy another one. For example, your iPhones. Uh, there's perceived obsolescence. It's how stuff is always going out of fashion or out of trend. And so you feel a new pressure to go, like it still functions, the shirt still fits, right? But you, you feel this pressure to go buy a new one because you gotta be on trend. There's consumer credit, which is basically just stealing money from your future self with interest. Not very smart. And then there's also targeted ads and big data, which is maybe the most powerful one today. So, okay, you're constantly, you're constantly being harvested for your data. You know that, right? Like Alexa, Siri, they're, they're, they're harvesting the cookies on the website. You know, they're not cookies. They're actually just harvesting your data. That's a really clever wordplay for I'm harvesting your data. And here's what they do. They sell your data to marketers and to organizations that want to sell you their product. And so they know exactly what products to deliver to you exactly how to make you believe that you don't just want them, but you need them, exactly what channel to deliver that on, and exactly how to message it to you to make it as seductive and tempting as possible. And all of that, all five of these, in the effort to make you to believe no matter how much more you have, you need to get more. We're being discipled to that. And more than you realize and more than you admit, you've probably succumbed to that. Here's the second part of the American dream gospel. Uh, do you, do you. You'll never discover the true you until you do you. This is what's being sown into the minds of our kids, y'all, especially the emerging generation. It's said like this, be you. You are who you are. Follow your heart. Do what you feel. Live free. Be authentic. Don't conform to societal standards or to your mom and dad or to your church, to political authority, to any external authority at all. Don't look out. Instead, look within. You do you. In fact, I believe that in our culture, the only unforgivable sin is not being your authentic self or allowing others to be their authentic self. Now, let me be clear here. When I say in our culture says your authentic self, again, that's just really clever wording uh, to, uh, to talk about doing whatever you feel. That, that, what that basically means is your authentic self is just doing whatever you feel like doing on the inside. And here's an interesting cultural observation. Did you know that we are one of the first societies in all of recorded human history <clears throat> that thanks to the good life is all about doing whatever you feel like doing. We are pioneers in this regard. Now, we are not the first society to realize that humans have deep-seated appetites, powerful desires. People have known that for thousands of years. But what makes our culture different from all the other ones is that all the other ones believe that just because you have these feelings doesn't mean you have to act on them. In fact, every other culture and society before us had these sort of shared norms and values that they synergized around and restrained their appetites in order to accomplish because they believed that restraining themselves for these shared values, whatever they were, were good for the individual and even more important, good for the community. The Greco-Roman world had the four classic virtues. I think those were developed by Aristotle. Christians have the love commands, the fruits of the spirit, and so on. Jews have the 10 commandments and the Torah. Muslims have the classic virtues from the Quran, as well as their five pillars. Buddhists have the eightfold path. It's, it's across the religious spectrum. It's across the geographic spectrum. It's across the time spectrum. Every culture before us had shared norms they synergized around and restrained their desires for. And tell us, and now you have the United States of America, and we look at that and we say, well, that's just bigotry. That's hate, that's oppression. In fact, here's how, you, uh, here's how you formulate your identity. The way to define your identity is not to exercise self-control over the desires inside, but instead it's to listen to them, express them, create an identity around them, champion them, and then destroy anyone who might threaten them. And hence the divided states of America. 
You wonder why we're so tribalistic and everybody hates each other? There you go. There you go. So get more do you. The gospel of the American dream. I got a question for you. How's it going? Meaning significance, happiness. Is it delivering it? How's it? How's it going? Is it working? See, this is just my humble opinion from my observations, but, but here's what I would suggest to you. I don't think it's working. In fact, maybe, maybe just constantly indulging on more and more and more and more and more and more isn't the path to inner peace and contentment, maybe. Or maybe doing whatever uh, you feel like, whenever you feel like it, isn't wise, healthy, or considerate to others. Maybe, just maybe, the get more do you mindset isn't capable of giving us happiness, meaning, and significance. In fact, maybe this whole big list behind me isn't the American dream, but rather it's the American demise. Because here's what I've seen. I've seen a culture that has more stuff, more tech, more access than ever, but we're not happy. There's a mental health epidemic wreaking havoc on our country right now. I see a country that has more self-autonomy and opportunities to express yourself, to live your life however you want to, to raise your family, aim your career, do with, what your do with your body whatever you want to. But has that created some sort of peaceful utopia? It's not what I see. I see people tribing up, hating on each other, slandering the other. There's just this undercurrent of slander, hate, demonization. Luxuries are more luxurious, sex is more accessible than ever, food tastes better, the, the world has been flattened and globalized. And yet is it all better? I don't know, in fact, you know what I see? I see just this lingering, undeniable sense of dissatisfaction among most people. One author put it like this once. Uh, he said, we cannot escape the promise that we can have it all. And we also cannot escape the truth that we can't have it all, and it's just crushing. You know, in preparation for this sermon series, uh, I actually wrote a, a poem. For some of you are like, I didn't know you had that side, Tyler. I, just, I write, okay, I write every weekend. Okay, I, I write, I don't usually share it, but I, but I write. And, um, and for me, I think this poem captures this lingering sense of discontentment that I see in America today. I read some of it to you last week in online church. I want to read it to you in full this week. <clears throat> I call it a journal entry of the American dreamer. I am haunted. Promised hope, vapid hope, gone as hope. Haunted. Haunted by the reality that there has to be more to life than just this. There has to be more to life than all this because I have all this. Look at all this. Who taught me I needed all this? I've spent my life acquiring all this. I worked hard to achieve all this. Now I have all this and all those and all that. And even if I had all the rest, it wouldn't put to rest how haunted I am. There has to be more. More than the mundane of my nine to five. More than increasing value for shareholders. More than paying the bills, upgrading the house, and climbing the org chart. More than meeting everyone else's expectations. More than self-autonomy. More than freedom. More than doing what I want, what I feel, and what I see. More than wake up, work, Netflix, repeat. More than the next drink, the next like, the next hookup, the next season, or the next show. More than the American dream. More than retiring and then waiting to die. More than just pursuing more. There has to be more. Oh God if there is a God. Now, if that connects with even just the smallest sliver of your soul and your experience today, I have good news for you. There's more. I believe there's more. There is hope, there is a God. 
His name is Jesus. And he offers a kingdom culture for you and I to live in that stands in direct opposition to the gospel of the American dream. And it's so much more effective than it in delivering meaning, significance, and happiness. Okay, so, so back to Luke 5. All right, do you guys remember that? We read about 20 minutes ago. Okay, back to Luke 5. Okay. In Luke chapter 5, Jesus is teaching. The crowds are growing. In fact, it says the crowds start pressing in on Jesus and he has like this Pope Francis moment, right? So hey, give, give Pope Francis a break. Even Jesus is like, listen, I need a little space, a little, little breathing room here. And so uh, Jesus goes over to Peter, okay? And at this point, Peter's not like the rock, the apostle upon which the church is built. He's just Peter, like a, a normal bystander watching and interested in Jesus, believing that maybe there may be a little bit of messianic potential in this guy, but he hasn't decided yet. And so he goes over to Peter and he's like, Peter, can I just get in the boat for a sec? Because he's kind of getting kind of hot and I, let me preach from there. And so he gets in the boat and he preaches from there for about uh, a little while, well, a little while longer. And then when he finishes, I don't know why he says this to Peter. Maybe it's like to pay him back or maybe it's to call him in. But he says to Peter, hey, well, I'm done preaching. Put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Now, let me tell you what Peter was thinking in this moment. All right. Peter was thinking, stay in your lane, carpenter stay in your lane. You build tables, I catch fish. All right, so stay in your lane. Now the scripture doesn't actually say that, but I know this is what he's thinking because for most of us, when somebody outside of our expertise starts speaking into our expertise, we're just thinking to ourselves, stay in your lane. This is your experience with your boss every day. You're like, stay in your lane. Okay, now Peter's, Peter's nicer than us though. Uh, so he, he, he phrases it a little bit different. Uh, verse five, he looks at Jesus and he says, master, we've worked all night long, but have caught nothing. okay. We're fishermen and they just ain't biting today. Yet, if you say so, can you hear the reluctance? If you say so, I will let down the nets. And so they sail out and he lets down the nets. Peter submits conventional wisdom of a fisherman to the authority of Jesus reluctantly and he lets down the nets. And what happens next? all the fish, like all the fish. I don't, I don't know if it was like a miracle where fish just started appearing in the nets or like all the fish in the lake swarmed, to, the fish don't swarm, schooled to this pot, spot, but they get them in the nets and Peter's like, I don't got enough room in the nets. Come over here, boys. And the boys come over and they get them in the nets and all of a sudden the boats are sinking and Peter's freaking out and he hits his knees. And what does he say? He has this Isaiah six moment. He says, I'm a man of unclean lips. I'm a sinner. I am unworthy. Okay, away from me, depart from me. You ever read Isaiah's prophetic calling in Isaiah six? When Isaiah comes face to face with the Lord and is calling as a prophet, he hits his knees and says, I'm a man of unclean lips, depart from me, Lord. And this is kind of like what happens to Peter. It's an echo of that here. And what I love about Jesus' response is he doesn't look at Peter and say, no, you're not a sinner. No, you're not unworthy. No, no, no. Instead, he looks at Peter and he says this. He says, you have nothing to fear. Okay, yeah, you're a sinner. Yeah, you are unworthy to be in my crew. In fact, you're gonna make some pretty big mistakes. Put your foot in your mouth a time or two over the next few years. I can promise you that, Peter. But you have nothing to fear in me. And from this day forward, you will be catching people. And when they had brought their boats to shore, they left everything and followed him. They left everything and followed him. They left everything and followed him. And there you have it. The invitation from Jesus to happiness, meaning, and significance. Leave everything and follow him. Peter, James, and John do in a moment. Notice everything that was primary becomes secondary in a moment. Their job becomes secondary. And they just had the best day in the history of their job. They're about to be very wealthy. I mean, they just hauled in two boatloads of fish that almost sunk the boats. It's a good day, right? But they're like by job, which means they were also like by family. Back then, it was usually family businesses. Basically, if your dad was a potter, you're a potter. If your dad's a carpenter, you're a carpenter. If your dad's a fisherman, you're a fisherman. And so James and John, it's the family business. But they're like, see you later, dad. Okay, because we've got some more important important business to handle here. Everything becomes secondary. That means they also would have sacrificed their reputation because the people in their community would have been like, well, that's not very nice to mom and dad. And also this is a Messiah figure from Nazareth. Really? Nazareth. Okay. You've heard that one before. Oh, and they also in short order would be giving up their ethical vision of the kingdom of God, because you know what comes after Luke five, Luke six, Luke six. And in Luke six, uh, it has, it has Luke's version of the sermon on the Mount. 
So the disciples find out very, very quickly that Jesus' vision of the kingdom and what is right and good was very different than their expectations. And yet it all, all that was primary becomes secondary to this one invitation. I'm gonna leave everything and follow. Maybe I could say it to you like this. In the moment where Peter, James, and John recognize Jesus' true identity, they recognize their true identity as well. And it's built on five things according to this story. One, I am a sinner unworthy. Yet two, I have nothing to fear in Jesus. Because three, he's the leader. Four, I am a follower of his. And five, I am a fisher of others. One, two, three, four, five, pretty simple. But I can promise you this. If you ingrain these five principles into your identity this year, you will be on a path towards significance, meaning, and deep joy in this life. More so than perhaps you have ever been. I promise you that. Now, here's what else I can promise you. Accepting this identity is rejecting the identity of the American dream. Hear me now. You will have to reject it because the gospel of Jesus is a gospel of self-sacrifice instead of self-fulfillment, self-denial instead of self-expression. This is not get more. This is surrender all. This is not do you. This is deny self. And that I can promise you, it's so worth it. So one, two, three, four, five, here's your identity. The question is, is will you make this your identity? Is this truly, follower of Jesus, is this truly your identity? Now, interesting thing, um, there's this book that came out like last year, maybe the year before, uh, by James Clear called Atomic Habits. H have you read this? Anybody read this book? It's an interesting book, you should read it. Um, and in Atomic Habits, uh, one of the main points that he makes is, um, is what he, he, he says, if you want to resist temptation, and create new habits, there are basically two approaches that you can take as a human being. You can either take an outcome resistance approach or an identity resistance approach. All right, now, most of us take outcome approach rather than identity approach. And yet, he says, the research supports that the identity approach is far more effective. The outcome approach says, well, that's not an outcome I want. The identity approach says, okay, that's not who I am. And yet most of us lean in this direction. Okay, I'm gonna give you an example. This will help it make sense for you. Um, let's say you, uh, let's say you're on a New Year's diet. Hmm. Uh, and, uh, and, and you're out with a buddy and your buddy's like, hey, uh, let's, let's go get a scoop of ice cream. Now, you know what outcome resistance would look like? Outcome resistance would be you saying to your buddy, well, you know, I do love ice cream and you know how I love that. I'm addicted to sugar for sure. But, but I'm, on this, I'm on this whole 30, uh, you know, diet or, or whatever. And so like, I've got to white knuckle this. I got the willpower. I'm just going to make it for 30 days. And okay, it's just one cheat. Give me a double scoop, right? And this is what happens. You just kind of slide into, you kind of slide into the outcome that you said you're going to resist. Now, on the flip side, an identity resistance approach would be like this. Your friend would say, hey, you want to get some dessert? And you would look at him and say, that's not who I am. <laughs> and it's a little intense for ice cream. <laughs> and your buddy will probably never invite you out for ice cream ever again. But, but here's what I love about the approach. When it comes to fighting back against intense longings and intense appetites and intense desires, you need an intense approach. You do. So when everyone else, all your friends are buying the new car and the bigger house that they can't afford and drowning in debt with no margin to do anything with their money other than pay off the debtor, you can just look at them and say, I'm a follower of Jesus, that's not who I am. When all of your peers are putting in 60, 70, 80, 90 hour weeks, there's no Saturday, there's no Sabbath day. Okay, when they're sacrificing their, ch their kids' childhoods on the altar of work, when their marriage is falling apart, when their physical and mental health is burned down to a wick because they work, 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 you can look at them and say, hey, that's just not who I am. When marriages are constantly breaking apart for no other reason than the grass may be greener on the other side. You can look at our culture and say, that's not who I am. Or when everyone else is forming their identity around everything else, around how much money they can make, how much power they can have, how high on the org chart they can climb, what group they can roll with, their sexuality, their politics, whatever, you fill in the blank. You can look at our culture in the eyes and say, that's not who I am. My identity is grounded in, okay, not something, someone far greater than that. It's Jesus. And one, two, three, four, five, here's what it looks like. I'm a sinner unworthy, yet I have nothing to fear from him. He's the leader, I'm the follower, and I'm a fisher of others. 
Now, you know what's fascinating to me? In uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, after years of following Jesus and leading for Jesus, Peter reflects on his life. Okay, he's, he's followed Jesus for three years. He's seen crucifixion and resurrection. He's now like leading the thing. He's leading the church because Jesus is gone. And in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, reflecting on it all, he writes this to a church he's a shepherd over. He says, here's what I've realized in my life. By his divine power, God has given us, 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 everything we need for living a godly life. Everything. You already have everything. The moment you stepped in him, the seed of the Holy Spirit was planted inside of you. Your identity was made new and you may not have known it or realized it or actualized it, but from that moment forward, you had everything inside of you for living a godly life. The question is, is, do you believe that's the truest reality of you? That you have everything. I do. Which means in 2020, my goal is not to put something in you. My goal, church, is to pull something out of you. Your identity, because you have everything. But do you believe that? Because if you believe that, we have to stop spiritualizing this away. We have to stop compartmentalizing this identity to like an hour on Sunday morning. We have to stop pretending like Christianity is all about like the brands we wear. You know, okay, I've got my, I've got my Love the Ville cup and my Not Today Satan shirt and a tattoo on my arm. Look at me. Now look, that's good. Go for it. That's great. But at the end of the day, if that's it, then you're just gonna get sucked right into the American dream. It has to be more than that. You are more than that. In fact, you know who you are? This is who you are in Jesus. <clears throat> you are chosen, not rejected. You are royal, not common. You are holy, not sullied. You are new, not old. Somebody just needs to receive this today. So just, just receive this. You are alive, not dead. You are sanctified, not static. You are growing, not wilting. Justified, not guilty. Blessed, not cursed. An overcomer, not a victim. You are a child, not an orphan, adopted, not alone, friend, not enemy, in light, not in darkness, powerful, not powerless, winning, not losing, a saint, not a sinner, saved, not condemned, eternal, not temporary, empowered, not afraid, selfless, not selfish, generous, not indulgent, submitted to Jesus, not your feelings, following Jesus, not your heart, in Jesus, not of the world, this is you. You are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. And because of that, you can discover yeah, praise God. It's okay to clap. You can discover the deep significance, the soul-saving meaning, and the life-giving joy. That's only in him. So question, I guess the question for you is this, though. Do you believe this? Do you believe this is the truest version of you? Do you believe this is your identity? Hey, in 2020, there's a New Year's resolution for you. Pound that into your heart. So one more time, one, two, three, four, five. Here's a good exercise for you. Take a picture of this. Take a picture of the screen and, and circle one of these and make this your goal, your resolution this month. For some of you, you're a top liner. You're a top liner. You've been trying to create, or excuse me, you've been trying to live the, the life God created you to live without God. Without God, that's impossible. So you just need to start at the top line and just acknowledge him. I'm a sinner unworthy. I can't do this alone. Come on, Jesus. I got nothing to be afraid of, so come on, Jesus. You just need to accept him. We'll do the baptism thing today. Let's go. Or for some of you, you're bottom liners. And you need to start following. Followers are not static, followers step, right? So you need to start following. What's your next best step? Or for some of you, you need to get on mission and you need to start asking, where is where's Jesus calling me to unleash the love? In the home, workplace, city, church, where? I don't know where it is, but, but get more. Do you, that's not who you are. This is who you are. This is who you are. And who you are is so much more. Now, we do me a favor, let's stand together. Here's how we're gonna close. I'm gonna close the way we started. We're gonna read scripture as a prayer of benediction here. Uh, this is Matthew chapter 13, two parables that Jesus uh, spoke once, and I want you to read these together with me as a prayer of resolution for this year over our church. Read this with me. Uh, God's kingdom is like a treasure hidden in a field for years and then accidentally found by a trespasser. The finder is ecstatic. What a find! and proceeds to sell everything he owns to raise money and buy that field. Or, God's kingdom is like a jewel merchant on the hunt for excellent pearls. Finding one that is flawless, he immediately sells everything and buys it. 
And that is my prayer over our church, God, that we would sell everything, that we would surrender everything, and we would leave everything and follow you. It is a path to abundant life. Send the Holy Spirit to help because we are weak without him. It is impossible without him. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, Wait, thank you for joining us here in our online campus this weekend. We really are so glad that you were here. We know that your time is valuable and it is such a privilege that you choose to spend your time here with us. We hope that you're walking away from this sermon today feeling encouraged or hopeful, but also convicted to go out and unleash the love of Jesus no matter where you are. We hope you'll come back and join us next week, either here online or at one of our physical campuses. But for now, know that we love you and we're praying for you. Go out and love the Ville, no matter where you are. We'll see you next week. <laughs>